So in this video, we're going to be going over developing a differential diagnosis and some different uh, ways that people have developed to think about a broad differential and make sure that you're not pigeonholing yourself into what you think is the most likely diagnosis and forgetting something else that could potentially be going on. So I'm not really big on using mnemonics for differential diagnoses just because I never really um, put that into my practice. Um, but a lot of people do when they're trying to when they're stumped on a on a case and they can't really figure out what's going on and that's probably been the one time I've actually done it. So the one that I've used in the past is Vindicate. Um, so with each of these letters, you're gonna have a different type of disease process that can be causing um, whatever it is that's going on with the patient. So let's get into it. So let's say we have a patient with chest pain. So um, uh, we can go through this mnemonic to see what are the potential causes of chest pain in this patient. So if we look at the vascular, the vessels part, so that um, when we think of vascular, we're thinking of um, something wrong with the actual vessels themselves. So uh, if we are thinking about angina or a myocardial infarction, which is just a occlusion of those vessels, that would fit into this part right here. So an MI or angina. Um, if we think of vessels themselves, that can be something like an aortic dissection. So, so uh, this kind of fits in that area, aortic dissection. Uh, now, if we move on to I, that's inflammatory or infectious. I put inflammatory in front. Um, a lot of people think infectious first and foremost, but I want to remind you guys that um, inflammatory processes include infection. So um, when we look at the white blood cell count and we see it's elevated, I want you to think first inflammatory and then after that infectious. So um, with I, uh, inflammatory and infectious, we can think of something like a pneumonia. Um, neoplasm, we didn't really talk about that. That's basically cancer. And so chest pain, if you have cancer in the chest, it can cause pain. So that can be breast um, or even lung cancer can cause chest pain. Uh, Drugs or diet. So um, this is basically anything that you take or anything that you ingest in. So um, it can be a diet here is meaning more food, but it can also be kind of like toxic ingestions as well. So one thing that can cause um, chest pain, uh, it, it falls into the drugs category is cocaine. Um, so cocaine it, it will cause all of your vessels to contract and, and, to, um, and to narrow and it's basically vasoconstriction. And so if you have coronary arteries that are already kind of narrowed here because of plaque, now if everything constricts inwards, you're gonna have more occlusion of this and you're not getting that forward flow anymore. And so you can have basically a heart attack with something like a cocaine use. Um, diet, I couldn't really think of anything, but if we're talking overall just a um, uh, poor diet that can lead to coronary arter artery disease where you have a narrowing of the vessel, uh, because of the plaque, and so that can give you angina. Um, next is uh, the eye for idiopathic. Idiopathic just basically means that we don't know what's going on. So if we exhaust everything here, we, we went through all the differentials, and we still can't figure out what's going on, well, we call it idiopathic. Um, it's not a very satisfying diagnosis, but it happens sometimes. Um, C is for congenital, and so congenital just means anything that you were born with. And so if you have a patient um, that uh, in their heart, um, let's, uh, this is a terrible heart drawing. Um, so within their heart, uh, these are the atria, that's your ventricle. Um, if they have something like a ventricular septal defect where there is no septum here between, uh, between the left and right ventricles, so if this is your septum between the left and right, um, but you have a VSD where there's a communication between the two sides, um, you don't have that, that pressure, pressure differential here, and some of the oxygenated blood that's coming into um, the, the, the left side of your heart from the lungs, it's going to go back in here um, to the right side, and then vice versa. Some of that, that deoxygenated blood, the, the one that doesn't really have oxygen, can go into that left side and get pumped to the rest of the body. Now, if this happens for a long period of time, you can end up with heart failure, and so that that can cause chest pain if you aren't able to really, if your heart is failing and you're starting to have ischemia, but typically heart failure doesn't necessarily cause chest pain. It can cause more shortness of breath. 
but congenital just refers to anything that that occurred to you um, that that happened at birth that you were born with and it can cause chest pain another example of this is um, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy so in hypertrophic hypertrophic cardiomyopathy or hokum um, what happens is the the septum uh, between the left and right ventricle is a little thickened um, at the point where the the blood typically goes out into the um, aorta. And so if, uh, let's draw this over here. So if the septum is thickened up here and you are supposed to have this outflow tract to the aorta, um, when the heart squeezes, you can have um, a failure of this pump system because you can't push anything out because this part of the septum is much thicker than it's supposed to be and it's obstructing that outflow track. And so when your heart is beating and trying to pump that blood out, it gets stuck here and it can't do that. So th these are the, the young athletes that uh, are playing basketball or football or whatever it is and they just drop dead. And it's because they lose all cardiac output um, because of this obstruction. So that's called uh, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And it's one of the reasons why we have sports physical exams um, for kids that want in to go into sports is to make sure that we don't find this or, or make sure that we don't miss this. Because if we miss this and a kid goes out and plays and drops dead, well, that is a preventable, uh, that was a preventable death um, that should have never happened. So, um, so that's, uh, that falls under congenital um, heart disease. Next after uh, congenital is uh, autoimmune or allergic. So allergic makes sense. If you have an allergic reaction and it causes everything to vasodilate and you're in, or if you're in anaphylaxis and your throat um, closes up, then you can have, it's usually not chest pain, it's usually shortness of breath and, and you can't breathe. Um, but autoimmune, um, we can think of something like, uh, something like, I guess, sarcoidosis where you can have a um, a inflammatory process going on with the pericardium and it can cause a pericarditis and that can give you chest pain. Um, there are probably other autoimmune processes that I'm not thinking of right now, but um, I can try to think more if anybody's interested in that. Um, so next is T for trauma um, or treatment. So trauma uh, if we think of the the things that we've talked about before, that can be something like a pneumothorax where um, somebody gets hit in the chest uh, and it, it punctures the lung or you have that air leakage from inside the lung into the thoracic cavity and you have um, basically that, um, that's a terrible lung, but you have that space there and you have a collapsed lung inwards and that can cause a lot of pain. Um, treatment is it refers to anything that we gave you that can cause chest pain. Um, so a lot of times, so I think it was the number three cause of mortality or morbidity in the United States is, it, uh, is, um, what we do to our patients, what our treatment that we give the patients, um, that can cause harm to the patient. And so that's why we're always thinking about what, what's the risk, what's the benefit. Um, and so when, when we say treatment here, we're, we're referring to that something that we did to the patient that caused harm. If you think about, um, if you think about a pleural effusion, so instead of having air in here between the lung and the um, and the chest wall, if you have fluid in here and you put a needle in to try to extract that fluid out, if we push that needle too far and we puncture the lung, well, now we have a pneumothorax and that's something that we did to the patient. And last, we have endocrine causes of chest pain. Um, I had to think about this one a bit more, um, trying to think of what can cause chest pain in endocrine system. The only thing that I can think of is your thyroid. So if you have like a thyroid storm where your thyroid hor hormone is super elevated, um, it can cause palpitations and you can overwork your heart. And if you have coronary artery, artery disease, you can have something like angina. Um, so uh, thyroid hormone is... Um, it's the way that I think of it, it's kind of like a steroid. It's not actually a steroid, uh, but it causes everything to ramp up. And so you're going to have an elevated heart rate. You're going to start, um, your, your, your body's going to basically be going into overdrive. And so that's, that was the only way that I can think of, uh, an endocrine process causing chest pain. Um, there are probably is others that I'm just not thinking about right now. So, um, Pete, I typically use this system, um, when I'm trying to figure out some, uh, a case that I haven't been able to solve. 
um, that it just doesn't fit yet. I go back and see, well, is there a vascular problem that can be causing this? Is there an infectious process or inflammatory process? Can this be cancer? Um, maybe they took some drugs or, or had some in toxic ingestion. Um, idiopathic, I don't really think of because in the end it's going to be idiopathic if you can't think of um, what it is. Congenital, um, by the time I see patients in the hospital, they're, they're usually on the elder side. So the congenital process is usually caught before then. And so that if it is, we kind of already know that that's going on and that can help us in our differential. Allergic, that's pretty straightforward. And so if we have an exposure and it causes an allergic reaction, we'll know more or less then. Um, but autoimmune is one that, that it's kind of, it, unless it's a classic presentation of an autoimmune process, that one is typically, for me at least, um, uh, later on the line when I rule everything else out, I think start thinking of autoimmune process. Um, trauma is pretty straightforward. Treatment, something that we did to the patient. And then endocrine, also we think about the endocrine system and see if there's any hormones or any signaling pathway that is out of whack that can be causing the patient's symptoms. And so a lot of you have been asking me what exactly I want you to put down when, when you turn in your differential diagnosis sheet. And in all honesty, I didn't have a set um, sheet that I wanted you to fill out or anything like that. It was more of kind of what is it that, that you got out of it, what your differentials were for these cases, and what were your justifications for it. So if we think about a chest pain case, um, I guess if we want to make it more standardized, um, this is the format that I would want you to put it in. So um, what your different disease processes are, um, and these are, this is going to be your differential diagnosis right here. And so I would want you to list out kind of what you think is more likely versus what you think is less likely and why. And so list it out um, in order of um, most likely to the least likely. Um, so I least likely so that I know kind of what what your rankings are and um, it's going to help me um, because I'll be able to look at what the reasons why you think each of these are more likely versus less likely and um, get your thought process that way and so uh, if we think of a guy that has exertional chest pain that gets better with rest and they have ST segment elevations um, on EKG well number one is going to be an MI and we write you know um uh, exertional chest pain uh, um, that's better with rest and then plus uh, ST elevations on EKG um, and then uh, last like let's say that it's early on and the patient doesn't have elevated troponins so it's uh, less likely because of normal troponins um, but we have ST segment elevation so that's still number one on our differential diagnosis so um, I want you to kind of do this for each of the disease processes that you have. And if you can't decide between like a, a pneumonia and GERD, that's okay. Like you just, you can group them on, you know, what's more likely and what's less likely. So um, use this format um, so that I can see what your thought process is. And um, that way I can, if you have any questions about your differential diagnosis, if you had questions on if you were on point or if you were a little off, you can send me this and uh, I can take a look at your thought process and we can discuss it. Let me know if going through this mnemonic was helpful or was it just more helpful to see my thought process going through an actual case. Because if, um, if you think that this is more helpful kind of going through each of these possibilities, I might do that for the abdominal pain one. But if you just want me to go through an abdominal pain case, I can do that as well. So um, I look forward to speaking with you all this weekend and working through these cases. Uh, the next set of cases is most likely going to be abdominal pain, so keep an eye out for the material for that. And if you have any other questions, let me know. I was going to put out a video on EKGs and reading radiology, but I feel like there's probably more um, well well constructed videos out there, and it would be better if I just send you those. So I'm gonna look up, I'm gonna look up a few of those and send it to you in your classroom. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to reach out.